Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Cambridge Union for our week six debate. This house believes the two-state solution is not is dead, even. That would be a bad misstart. Um, as with all of our debates, this is being live streamed, so hello to everyone who's watching online. You're now able to vote, and there should be a link on the page for you to do that at the end of the debate. With our debates, there's a great chance for you guys to get involved and ask questions. You can do this in two ways. The first of those is to stand up and say point of information or on that point during somebody's speech. The speaker doesn't have to accept it. They might be running out of time, for example, or have accepted too many. Um, and please try and keep these as short as you can, but that's to address something the speaker has just said. The second way is we'll be doing two rounds of floor speeches where we'll go around and invite one of you to speak in proposition, one in opposition, and one in abstention of the motion. It's really, really interesting and great fun to get involved in that way. And also, uh, for those of you who don't know, the best, speech on, the best floor speech of this term wins a free bike. Um, which should be any incentive to do that. Yeah. The only other note for this debate is that uh, obviously it is a contentious issue. If anyone feels that they need to leave at any point, please feel free to do so. Um, and we tolerate many things here because we are a free speech society, but we don't tolerate any personal attacks. So if there are any, if there are any of those, I will have to step in um, and try and control it, which will be difficult. Otherwise, without further ado, let's get started. This house believes the two-state solution is dead. Our first speaker for proposition is Bassem Eid, an analyst for Israeli TV and radio. Eid is a, is a Palestinian human rights activist. Most recently, he's broadened his research to include human rights violations committed by the Palestinian Authority. Bassem, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, of course, for each of you who attend this uh, event, and thanks for the Cambridge Union Society for inviting me here. Yes, unfortunately, it's dead. And I think that the first one who declared on the death of the two-state solution was the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, just a few months ago when he said and declared very loudly and proudly that the Oslo Agreement is dead. So if the Oslo Agreement is dead, in my opinion, the two-state solution almost dead. And I want to try to clarify why the two-state solution almost dead. I think that the major failure issue of the Palestinians recently was after the Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip in 2005. Since Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005, what we, the Palestinians, almost did for the Gaza Strip, in my opinion, I think that we, the Palestinians, almost destroyed what remains from the Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip. And I remember very well, after Sharon declaration on the Israeli uh, uh, withdrawal from Gaza, how the Palestinian leaders start running from one TV channel to another TV channel by saying, that if Israel will withdraw from Gaza Strip, we are going to make from Gaza Strip Singapore. I never been in Singapore, but I am wondering if the situation in Singapore right now is like Gaza. I think that that was the most failure test that the Israelis almost put the Palestinians on it. On the other side, I think that since the Oslo Agreement until today, the majority of the Palestinians these days in Gaza Strip and in the West Bank are people who are seeking dignity rather than identity. If you will come today to any ordinary Palestinian in the West Bank and asking him, 
what are the most three priorities that you are seeking? He will say a job to survive, to ensure and to secure the education system and the health system for my children. Nobody is talking about settlements. Nobody is talking about the wall. Nobody even talking about the foundation of the Palestinian state. And that's giving the impression how people are really fighting right now for their own dignity. Friends, I used to tell my Palestinian colleagues, by the way, I am a person who developed for 33 years in a refugee camp. I used to teach my Palestinian colleagues in the refugee camps that homeland is not the place where you're born. Homeland is the place where you can find dignity, justice, and freedom. Any country around the world who can assure me these three issues, I have no problem to be considered as their own citizen. If we will look today to the Middle East and how unfortunately the Islamic terror surrounding it, we will find that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is still probably the most safe place in the Middle East. As an Arab, as a Muslim, I don't want to be in Syria. I don't want to be in Iraq. I don't want to be in Libya. I don't want to be in Yemen. It is much more safer for myself and for my children to continue living under the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. On the other side, sometimes I am really feeling so sad when some European countries' leaders are standing up by saying, if Israel is not going to resume the peace negotiations, we are going to recognize the Palestinian state. Which Palestinian state you are going to recognize? A state which is in a lack of infrastructure of states. A state which is in a lack of economic sources of state. A state where is over than 54% of its populations are living in refugee camps. This is not the state that I am looking for. This is not the state that the Palestinians are really dreaming for. I think that the international community is the main reason who made the two-state solution dead. Because the international community must have to recognize one important thing, that a state must have to be built before it's recognized. And I didn't see right now that the international community it try really to try to really put any kind of efforts in terms to build the Palestinian state. Unfortunately, since 10 years ago, the two-state solution become a kind, became a kind of slogan for the international community. It's like a song for the leaders, especially in Europe. Two-state solution. But what your country did towards the two-state solution, in my opinion, just nothing. And this is one of the major problems. That beside the Palestinians and the Israelis, who should have to be accused on the failure of the two-state solution, but also the international community it play a very big part in the failure of the two-state solution. Now, if the two-state solution almost dead, what is the alternative? One-state solution is not an alternative. The alternative is that, unfortunately, 
we the both sides, the Israelis and the Palestinians, must have to wait uh, probably for one or two more generations in term to renew the so-called two-state solution. I didn't see that in the coming 10 years at least, any kind of solution will take place between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Unfortunately, I think that the both societies here are really suffering, probably the Palestinians much more than the Israelis. But in the meantime, I didn't see that our leadership as a Palestinian are really trying to improve our situation. I don't want to talk about Gaza. I don't want to talk about the Hamas. Unfortunately, it looks like that since 10 years ago, looks like that the Palestinian leadership are much more supporting the three-state solution for two people. Because the Hamas is trying to defend their own Islamic emirate in the Gaza Strip. Abbas is trying to defend his own empire in the West Bank and the State of Israel. This is how we are living in the past 10 years. And looks like that everybody is so satisfied with his own. And that's probably one of the major obstacles for the Palestinians, how we became so divided right now. We are unable to create any kind of unity among ourselves. We are unable to achieve any kind of peace between ourselves. Look, since 2007, we are fighting each other, much more than we are fighting Israel, by the way. And this is one of the major problems here. Two million people in Gaza has been kept in the past 12 years as hostages under the Hamas rule, as hostages. And nobody around the world he tried to provide any kind of help in terms to release these two million people from a couple hundreds of so-called Hamas leaders. This is one of the major tragedies in the life of the Palestinians. I believe that if we, the Palestinians, will be one day united, eh, probably we will be able to push forward towards any kind of solution in the future. But while we are, the Palestinians, so divided, I don't think that that will help us to reach any kind of peace with the Israelis in the coming at least a few years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bassem. We now turn straight to the opposition and welcome Sharon Booth. Sharon is the founder and director of Solutions Not Sides, an educational organization which promotes a non-partisan attitude to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and a respect for the human rights of all. Sharon, <laughs> the floor is yours, thank you. Can I get some water? Thanks so much. Just one of these ones. Okay, good evening everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. And thank you to Bastam for speaking so eloquently first. Um, so, uh, the, is the two-state solution dead? I'm just gonna start by defining terms uh, in terms of what I understand by the terms two states uh, in this motion and the word dead. So two states, uh, I'm assuming that we're talking about the 1967 border lines or what's known as the green line as the basis uh, for, for, for a solution. Maybe give or take a few percentage of land swaps here and there, East and West Jerusalem as the respective capitals of the two states. That's what I'm gonna understand uh, in this uh, debate uh, 
that that's what we're talking about with two states. And the term dead, I'm going to understand and take that as being uh, that the two-state solution cannot and will not be implemented at any point ever now, from, from now moving onwards. And looking at it in that light, I would say maybe, Basam, you use the word renew in a generation or two, referring possibly to a two-state solution. So I would question whether perhaps you ought to be sitting on our side of the panel. But anyway, um, that's how I'm going to understand it. And that leads me to another question, which is, what is a nation state? So uh, the way I'm going to look at it, I, I don't know if you know, uh, there's kind of the modernist side of this debate and the primordial side of the debate when it comes to looking at nationhood. I'm going to look at it as being from the modernist side. Uh, that's the line that I would take. And I would go straight for Benedict Anderson's idea of imagined communities. I think that nation states are imagined constructs uh, of human beings. I think they have no ontological existence in themselves. And therefore, in that sense, can't be considered alive or dead. Human beings create or uncreate nation states out of their own political will. So it's at that point that I would move on to say, of course, if, even from a philosophical sense, that the motion is nonsensical. You cannot say that a nation state or a solution in that sense, two states or, or anything else, is dead. It could be, as Bessem so rightly pointed out, even if improbable at the moment, it could be resurrected. So the problem that I think we really need to highlight here in this chamber today is the fact, and I think maybe it's something we could all agree on, as has been mentioned as well by Bassam, that there is no political will at the moment. There hasn't been, I would say, for at least the past decade. There is no political will, not for two states, not for one state, not for anything else that, is, that could be called a viable and realistic solution. I actually think what is happening is that the political leaders involved on both sides, and internationally as well, are playing what you might call the Game of Thrones, the power game. They're using anger and fear as their main tools, and real implementation or even exploration of solutions on the behalf of the needs and interests of Palestinian and Israeli people is not in the equation. It's not as if, in the past decade or so, leaders have locked themselves in a room and stayed there until they've come out with a deal, as happened in the Jordan-Israel peace agreement. And if you look at grassroots polls and surveys that have been conducted, if you look, look at sort of, let's say, around a decade ago, you had roughly 70% on both sides that indicated they would be willing to accept, at least, a two-state solution, even if, uh, if we're honest, those poll results didn't line up on the details. But at the same time, um, we haven't had that kind of um, follow-up from the political leaders to implement that for their people. You've had Netanyahu, uh, the, the current leader and has been is now a long-serving Israeli prime minister. He has been talking about two states uh, a lot, but he has chosen to form his coalition with far-right parties and religious parties, whose main priority seems to be the promotion of settlement expansion, which, of course, is a deal-breaker for the Palestinians, who see themselves as already having made a historical compromise by accepting what they see as 22% of what, for, in their eyes, is historical Palestine. You've got uh, Hamas, who, at times, when they're politically weak, have paid some lip service to a possibility of a two-state solution. But in reality, they've been playing a zero-sum game, in my view. They have been using tactics of violence, which have uh, not only not liberated Palestine due to the power imbalance in this situation, it also, of course, results in the loss of life for many people, mainly Palestinians. And then you have Abbas, who arguably maybe wants a deal, goes to the UN, uh, bids at the UN, but he's politically weak as a leader, he is very corrupt, and I think also personally benefits from a continuation of the status quo. Meanwhile, what happens? The grassroots lose hope. So if you've seen the most recent poll that was conducted in November and December, the results were published at the end of last month, you will see that support for the two-state solution in both societies is now below 50%. The grassroots lose hope, 
Arguably not because they don't anymore believe in a two-state solution, but they, they simply can no longer imagine it. It's never going to happen uh, in their sense of, of, of hopelessness. And here's where we get to the point, maybe, of tonight's debate as well, is that, as Bersam has mentioned, uh, the international community, there's no political will here either. It seems that we, internationally, are more interested in using this issue for our own identity politics of whether or not we're right-wing or left-wing politically, and sometimes whether we're Jewish or Muslim. We pick our tribal identities and we choose a side, one against the other. We have the English Defence League out in our streets, waving Israeli flags, claiming they support Israel because it's the last frontier against uh, the, the, the Muslims who are coming to establish their caliphate in Europe. We've got the Occupy movement, the anti-capitalist protesters, outside St. Paul's with their Palestinian kefir, their Palestinian scarves, their Palestinian flags. We've got so-called Islamists, uh, so-called Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, who are using this issue to recruit for their own cause, their conspiracy theory, which is the counterbalance to the right wing, of course, here, uh, that the war uh, between the West and the Muslims, so-called, is a reality. And finally, of course, at the political level, we've got our party politicians. If you are more centrist than the Labour Party, you're probably going to be in Labour Friends of Israel. If you're more off to the left wing, you're probably going to be in Labour Friends of Palestine. The Conservative Party have a Conservative Friends of Israel. They don't even have a Conservative Friends of Palestine. Uh, Liberal Democrats are doing a little bit better. You can look into it. Anyway, even our party political leaders are setting this kind of example for us. And who suffers the most in all of this? Ordinary Palestinian and Israeli people who need a solution. So, <clears throat> how is this actually associated with right and left? If you look at the right wing, what do they particularly uh, concern themselves with? They concern themselves with security, and they concern themselves with national identity. Their main emotion, if you look into emotions in conflict, that they play upon is fear. And of course, when it comes to the Israel-Palestine situation, if you want to preserve national identity, uh, and you want to maintain security, uh, from an Israeli perspective, then probably your best framework for that would be a two-state solution. Meanwhile, if you look at more kind of the left-wing side of it, if you want to promote uh, the idea that nation-states shouldn't exist at all, uh, then you probably uh, take issue with the idea of, of a Jewish state of Israel existing, uh, and you may therefore promote a Palestinian state based on the idea that it always was Palestine anyway in, in, in that sense, which is a bit of an oxymoron, because Palestine is a national identity too. Um, but you have this kind of tug of war going on uh, between the left and the right, and you may well hear some of the arguments on the panel tonight coming from those perspectives. As I said, it's the people of Israel-Palestine who suffer most in this, um, and I think, in my view, it's irresponsible, actually, to claim that any solution should be dead, apart from the philosophical argument that I just made, that it's impossible to say that a, a human construct that has no life in itself is dead. Um, I think it's actually irresponsible, because rather than contributing to these kinds of dis dis divisions, we should be standing up and creating the political will that is necessary for any kind of solution to exist. So, I rest my case that if the political will were there to implement one state, two states, or anything else, we all know that it could, in fact, be implemented, and that if we actually care about the people of Israel and Palestine, uh, we will put our energies in that direction. Don't please vote for the, this side of the motion if you're more pro-Israel, and that side of the motion if you're more pro-Palestine. To be honest, if the motion was that a, two state, uh, that a one state solution is impossible, I would be on the opposition for that too. Please vote on the basis that we need to change the culture of this debate in this country and also feel free to look up Solutions Not Sides and what we do on that line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. We'll now begin our floor speech round. If you'd like to make a speech, please can you put your hand up and say your name and college for the record book. So, 
Would anyone like to make a speech in proposition of the motion, this house believes the two-state solution is dead? Yes. Thank you. You said that for you dead means that it, it cannot happen ever, but I disagree. I think we should regard it as in the foreseeable future. And as you, as you said, in the political climate at the moment, no one has the will. Uh, I know specifically on the Israeli side, uh, as you said, Netanyahu and his government are, are promoting the settlements. And even his possible replacements are his duplicates that repeating his statements. And the identity politics are true also for Israel in the, in, the, in the idea of one state or two state solution. And as you said, Abbas as well is, uh, has um, more incentive to continue with this. Uh, conflict. So unless something is going to fundamentally change, I don't see how is it possible in the foreseeable future. And um, so I think I'm um, replying. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak in opposition of the motion? Yes, at the back. Hello, I'm Nai from Peter House. Um, so I am for the opposition of this motion because I'm a very big optimist. And I do believe in humanity and do believe in humankind. And I think we will reach peace at some point if we had the will. Um, I'd like to start by saying that there is one thing that I find missing in both um, on both sides, which is we're talking about this conflict as if it was um, a two tables on an equal level. I think we need to outline that there, is, there are powers, um, there are different levels of powers on each side. And uh, in my opinion, there is an oppressed and an oppressor. And I do not, I cannot conceive how Mahmoud Abbas and everyone else on the Palestinian side is not doing any effort, but we are not here to blame in any way all the bombings happening on Gaza or what is happening to Ahed Tamimi or any other Palestinian kids being imprisoned, tortured, not allowed to see to go to the sea, uh, which is only 30 minutes away from their home country, uh, from, from their home. So I think, yes, a two-state solution is possible if both of the states put the will in it. However, there is one state, in my opinion, that needs to do a little bit more than that because I believe today, as an Israeli citizen, you do have quite a lot of rights everywhere you go in the world. Try to be a Palestinian citizen who cannot get a visa to go anywhere or who, cannot, who has to be humiliated at the borders of Jordan just to go back home or to go visit a friend. So I, I quite would like to, like, it is interesting to debate that motion um, with that, necessarily being entirely pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. But I think it is also important to establish the facts that we have today and is entirely responsible to say that one state has more power than the other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Finally, would anybody like to speak in abstention of the motion? Yes, on the bench. Um, I, it may have just been me, but sitting there, I felt that actually both of the opening speakers agreed with each other almost entirely, but just <laughs> defined the motion differently. So for the sake of the rest of the debate, perhaps it would be useful to agree on one definition and then debate that. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now return to the main debate, and our second speaker for the proposition is Gideon Levy. Gideon is an Israeli journalist and author who writes opinion pieces and weekly columns for Haaretz, which often focus on the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. Also, if you wouldn't mind speaking from the box, just so Tom can uh, show you when you're over time. But thank you very much, Gideon. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you. A few years ago, I've been to the, excuse me for mentioning it, in the Oxford Union debate, <laughs> and I obviously lost. <laughs> so that's your challenge tonight, to show that you are so much better than Oxford. <laughs> it will be maybe the first time in my life in which I'll recommend people to turn right and not to turn left. <laughs> it will be also the last time I'm going to do so. <laughs> the right-wingers in Israel, they claim that for the sake of 
the entire Eretz Israel, for the sake of maintaining the occupation, it is legitimate to lie. I claim tonight that it is legitimate to come with high fever to protect the one-state solution and to protect justice tonight because I'm very sick, so excuse me if I'll collapse. I ask for your mercy, for your pity, that's all. <laughs> I would like to claim today that the two-state solution is not dead. The two-state solution was never born. And if you are never born, you can't die. <laughs> That's the way it goes. There was never, ever an Israeli prime minister or an Israeli statesman in influential position who meant to put an end to the occupation. Never, ever. The whole thing was about lip service, about maintaining the occupation, strengthening the occupation, gaining more time to build more settlements. And how do I know it? You may ask, how do I know that they didn't mean to put an end to the occupation? Very simple. Because they never stopped building settlements. And if you don't stop building settlements, you mean to stay there. Nobody build one terrace in an occupied territory if you don't mean to stay there. And no Israeli prime minister really stopped building settlements, which is a violation of the international law, which is criminal from any point of view. So Israel never meant to put an end to the occupation. Israel never meant to go for the two-state solution. And the two-state solution served as a wonderful lip service for everybody. The Europeans say two-state solution. The Israelis say two-state solution. Benjamin Netanyahu say two-state solution. But not now. Some other time. What will be in some other time? We don't know. But now it's not the time. Let's wait. Another generation, another generation of Palestinians will live under this brutality of the Israeli occupation. And let's wait. We, we are not in a hurry, we Israelis. And for the Americans, this was also a wonderful game. To claim that the United States is in favor of the two-state solution and do nothing to put an end to the occupation. Because if there would have been one American president who would really like to put an end to the occupation, the occupation would have lasted another few months and would come to its end. But there was never also an American president who really wanted to put an end to the occupation. And then came our friend Donald Trump, whom we all like, I guess. He's extremely popular in Israel, the only place on earth. <laughs> and I must say to his favor, he declared the death of the baby which was not born, but at least he declared the death. He claimed that Jerusalem is off the table. He declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and only the capital of Israel. In other ways, in other words, there will be no two-state solution. And I'm very grateful to Donald Trump, who at least said the truth and put an end to this masquerade of the world condemning Israel for building settlements, of the EU condemning Israel for building settlements, of Barack Obama condemning Israel for building settlements, and Israel couldn't care less. And Israel could only build and build and maintain and strengthen the occupation until this stage in which it is irreversible. Between the river, the Jordan River, and the ocean, there are two peoples who live there. There are today, by figures, more or less 50-50. Around 6 million Jews, 6 million Palestinians, obviously including Gaza, including the Israeli citizens who are Palestinians. 6 million and 6 million, more or less. The best solution would have been a two-state solution. Two peoples share one piece of land, let's divide it. The most just division would have been 50-50, more or less. No, Israel would never go for it. The minimum that is on the table is 22% to the Palestinians, 78% to the Jews. Those are the six-day borders. Those are the 67 borders, the green line. I am not sure that this is justice, but I wish they would have gone to it. All my life I believed in a two-state solution. I'm ready now to admit that I'm totally wrong, and if someone will prove me that there is one Israeli statesman who really means to put an end to the occupation, to go for the two-state solution in the minimum lines of the 67 borders without any changes, by the way,
because that's really the minimum for a viable state, for a viable Palestinian state, I would step down and say I was wrong. But this doesn't happen. My friends, the one state is there. It is 50 years now. Israel is controlling the occupied territories from within, in the West Bank, from without, from outside, in Gaza. And it's all a one state. What's the problem about it? The only problem is that it's not a democracy. The only democracy in the Middle East is not a democracy, because in its backyard there is this brutal reality of military occupation for 50 years, of four and a half million people without any civil rights whatsoever, nothing. So the one state is there, and the struggle should be about its regime. The struggle should be about its democracy. The discourse must be about one man, one, one person, sorry, one person, one vote. Who can say no to one person, one vote? And if you say no to one person, one vote, what does this mean? Is there any other name but apartheid? It looks like apartheid, it walks like apartheid, it is apartheid. Because if you say... Because if you say that we are the chosen people and therefore we have rights that the Palestinians don't have, you say apartheid. No other definition. So let's challenge Israel. Are you in favor of equal rights, yes or no? If you say yes, great news, let's go for a one-state solution. It will be a long process, a painful process. Israel will have to say goodbye to the Zionistic dream which failed in a way and succeeded in other ways. But if Israel says no, which it will, then we can declare officially the birth of the new apartheid state in the Middle East. Because saying no to equal rights means apartheid. Now, I totally understand those Israeli fellows who dream about a Jewish state, who don't want a binational state. I totally understand it. But you can't have it all. You have to make up your mind. You want a Jewish state, you can't have the occupation. You want the occupation, you can't have a Jewish state. You want the Jewish state and the occupation, you can't be a democracy. You can't have it all. And the world should challenge Israel and ask Israel once and for all, for God's sake, what do you want? You want democracy, you want Jewish state, or you want apartheid? Please choose. But you can't have it all, and you will never have it all. So the one state is there, and people might think that it's a dream and it's a utopia to believe the Jews and Palestinians will be able to live in equality together. But I must tell you that after a few visits in South Africa, with all the problems in South Africa, and I know that South Africa, especially those days, is a very problematic place. But by the end of the day, the unthinkable happened in South Africa. And nobody can deny here that South Africa of today is not a more just place than South Africa 25 years ago. <coughs> Why? Because South Africa went for one person, one vote, for equal rights forever, for everyone. I got your hint, <laughs> a very delicate one. So I'm here tonight to tell you that we shouldn't continue this masquerade of claiming that we are going for the two-state solution. You mentioned Benjamin Netanyahu. He, he was in favor of it only in one speech. He never meant it, obviously. Nobody took him seriously, obviously. I mean, one should be really naive to believe that this man believes that the Palestinians deserve any kind of rights in this part of the world. But so were all the other Israeli prime ministers. They just changed the rhetorics. Shimon Peres spoke about peace. He got the Nobel Peace Prize. And he's the founding father of the settlements. So what kind of two-state solution is it when you build and build? Ehud Barak went to Camp David, offered Arafat the moon, they claim, or the sun. 
And at the same time, he built 6,000 new settlements. What, ki what kind of support of the two-stage solution is it when you build behind the back 6,000 more settlements and bring another tens of thousands of settlers who will never leave because they are there to stay. They never had the intention. Sorry? Sure. which, you know, is a, uh, an admirable opinion, that actually that, in a way, could be the fastest road possible to the implementation of a real two-state solution. Maybe, maybe. So this two-state solution potentially isn't dead, then? Listen, if, <laughs> if, if the Israelis will be really pushed to the wall and they'll have to chase two-state solution withdrawing for all the occupied territories, or a one-state solution, and they make the first choice, I will salute to you. So two states the isn't only <laughs> thing, no, but the only thing you ignore is the fact, and this will be my last sentence, the only thing you ignore in the occupied territories, they are right now over 700,000 settlers that no Israeli politician will ever be able to evacuate, and without their evacuation, there is no viable Palestinian state they are there point, to stay. They, they are the strongest political group in Israeli society. They are blackmailing one government after the other for decades, and they are the most powerful group in society. And there was never born the Israeli prime minister who could evacuate 700,000 settlers who went there only with one purpose, to prevent any kind of settlement. And they succeeded, and we better realize it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now move to the opposition and welcome Norman Finkelstein, American political scientist, activist, author, and professor. Finkelstein has conducted extensive research on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and on the, Holoca on the Holocaust. Norman, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> well, even in Gideon Levy's alleged illness, he has considerably more rhetorical force than I do. However, I do not believe that if the argument is carefully reasoned, and we try to set aside our emotions and passions that the argument he makes is persuasive. I'm going to try to lay out my argument in five theses which sum up, epitomize my point of view. Number one, Historical circumstances constrain political choices. Men make their own history, Karl Marx famously said, but they do not make it as they please. They do not, they do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. When it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, the question often put is, do you support one state or two? But that question is beside the point. The only pertinent question is, what is politically feasible under existing circumstances. Two, just because a solution is objectively rational or morally desirable does not make it politically feasible. Consider immigration. One in 10 US citizens is of Mexican descent. Millions of undocumented Mexican workers currently live in the U.S. 
while hundreds of Mexicans desperately seeking employment in the U.S. are killed each year along the border. The Mexican economy depends on $20 billion in remittances annually from Mexicans laboring in the U.S. And one half of the U.S. was stolen from Mexico. The rational and moral solution would obviously be to abolish the border between Mexico and the U.S. But politically, it is a pipe dream. It is impossible to muster the political will to effect a, so to speak, one-state solution to Mexican immigration. The defenders of immigrant rights must operate within the less than perfect framework of immigration reform. Then there is the time factor. Even if it could be demonstrated that a one-state solution in Israel-Palestine was materially inevitable and morally superior, that still would not make it politically feasible anytime soon. Immanuel Kant speculated back in the 18th century that amidst the chaos and conflict racking Europe, a rational plan was at work, inexorably propelling humanity towards a federation of states and the abolition of war. His prediction proved to be prophetic, but it took more than 200 years of death and destruction, evolution and revolution, advance and retreat, before the European Union came into being. Three, a political solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict requires international pressure on Israel. Although the struggle for Palestinian rights must be initiated by the Palestinians themselves, they cannot succeed on their own. Israel will not budge unless the international community compels it. The international consensus at the state level has for decades overwhelmingly supported two states. This past year, the annual UN General Assembly resolution, peaceful settlement of the question of Palestine, that calls for two states on the June 1967 borders, it garnered 157 votes, and only seven votes against. True, these are paper resolutions. But then think logically. Surely states will sooner come to act on what they formally support, two states, than on what they don't support dismantling Israel. The two-state consensus at the level of popular opinion is no less overwhelming. Consider, because Mr. Levy or Gideon, he's a friend, is a person of the left, so let's look at his camp. Consider just the left end of the political spectrum, whereas both Jeremy Corbyn in the UK and Bernie Sanders in the US, US have registered strong support for Palestinian rights. They have also emphatically affirmed Israel's statehood. In the wake of the Nazi Holocaust and compounded by Israel's effective exploitation and manipulation of it, the legitimacy of a Jewish state albeit undefined, has become deeply entrenched in public opinion. To paraphrase Marx, the nightmare of a dead generation weighs heavily on the consciousness and conscience of the living. It is improbable that a political agenda entailing 
the coercive dissolution of Israel will gain traction. Whereas the vision of a single democratic state is morally compelling, a Jewish refuge in the aftermath of the Nazi genocide carries surpassing moral power. Now Gideon mentioned the precedent of South Africa, but the notion of a white state did not command legitimacy after World War II. Quite the contrary. So international public opinion eventually swung behind a one-state solution in South Africa. In the court of public opinion, the legitimacy of a Jewish refuge state stands poles apart from the legitimacy of a white supremacist state. The apartheid precedent thus lacks political resonance or relevance. Four, material facts on the ground, such as illegal Jewish colonies, constitute a political impediment, but they do not preclude a two-state solution. The degree to which the 600,000 illegal Israeli settlers in the West Bank prevent the creation of a Palestinian state is in the first place technical in nature. The facts are authoritatively presented by Jan de Jong in a forthcoming volume edited by Jamie Stern Weiner. It is often imagined that the West Bank has been entirely overrun with Israeli settlers. In fact, a majority of the settlers are concentrated in several clusters. These settlements encroach, in fact, on about 5% of the occupied Palestinian territories. If a future Palestinian state is to be spatially contiguous and socioeconomically viable, it would require the evacuation of Jewish, Jewish settlers from all but 2% of the West Bank plus a 2% land swap with Israel. In such an eventuality, some 250,000 illegal Israeli settlers would have to be uprooted. Even as this is a formidable obstacle to overcome, dismantling the settlements and relocating the settlers still remains, as Palestinian political analyst Muin Rabani put it, a question of politics, not physics. Now, there's no question that it is a formidable obstacle, the settlements. However, the pertinent question in terms of tonight's resolution is this. Are Israelis more likely, are Israelis more likely to relinquish the Jewish settlements or relinquish the Jewish state? In other words, if the two-state solution is dead, then a one-state solution must also be dead. Five, declaring the two-state solution is dead is music to Israel's ears. To oppose tonight's resolution does not make one a Zionist, whatever that means, let alone a racist or apologist for Israel's crimes. Indeed, it is this speaker's considered opinion that Israel is guilty of grave crimes against humanity and must be held accountable for them. Indeed, as we speak, as we meet tonight, Israel is deliberately poisoning one million Palestinian children living in Gaza as they're forced to drink water that's not fit for human consumption. However, if I oppose the resolution, it is because the resolution is not only politically false, but politically irresponsible. It does no 
service to the Palestinian people to put forth slogans that, however idealistic, will alienate public opinion. Israel forever pretends that it faces an existential threat as its enemies want to destroy the quote-unquote only Jewish state. It is music to Israel's ears when Palestine supporters declare the two-state solution is dead and advocate instead Israel's dissolution in a unitary state where Jews are reduced to a minority. Israel can then plausibly claim it has no choice except to dig in its heels. Isn't it truer to the facts and politically wiser to proclaim that only Israeli recalcitrance stands in the way of a fair and equitable solution based on two states? Thank you. Norman, thank you very much. We'll now go straight to the proposition and our third speaker this evening, thank you for stepping in at late notice, is Alistair Donovan, a finalist historian at Peterhouse and one of the society's debating officers. Alistair, the floor is yours, thank you. Uh, can you pass the microphone up on me? Yeah. So, if for a solution to be possible, you require every current political actor to change and every existing incentive structure to be destroyed, I don't think that's a reasonable definition of what alive could be. If we need everything that currently exists to change to be able to implement a solution, that would probably mean that literally anything is politically possible and nothing could ever be described as dead. This might be nice for Sharon and her philosophical notions about whether or not things are dead and alive with their concepts, but in terms of having in any way a meaningful debate, it's probably not very helpful. Debate tonight is probably a factual question. For it to have any realistic meaning, it needs to be a question of can we see this solution being put in place at any point in the foreseeable future. Our side simply needs to argue that that's not the case. Saying there is a hypothetical scenario 200 years in the future where something might change and it might be possible probably doesn't mean you say it is alive. Do we need to prove that there is a better solution? Similarly, probably not. It's probably reasonable for everyone to conclude that there's no real clear way of ending the conflict, that it's going to be incredibly complex and if any solution ever is formed, we're unlikely to know exactly what the details of it are. But the fact that there is no better solution does not mean that the two-state solution is somehow on life support, that it is somehow still alive. It is okay to say that solutions can't be found, we have to accept that at the moment, but there's still no prospect of achieving this individual solution, and we probably should accept that. To be fair to Norman, he has a more interesting conception of this. His problem, though, is again that it requires a 200-year time frame and Kant's dubious example of Europe. And if we're going to talk about conflict in Europe in recent years, I'd say Yugoslavia. But I think even leaving this aside, it probably does mean it's dead if we require so much change to take place. And the particular thing that we do need to change in his idea is we need to move at least 250,000 people. He says it's a question of politics. Maybe it's a question of politics. But is it a politics situation that's going to change? Because it doesn't seem like there's a real lack of support for Jewish settlers at the moment within the political scene in Israel. It doesn't seem like that's really viable to change. And the only reason he says it could change is if there is a direct choice for Israelis. The choice is either their state entirely or these settlers. And it's unclear it would ever get to that circumstance. That circumstance. It's unclear that the Israeli state would ever allow that to happen. And it relies on them pretty much being incapable of enforcing their own interests over an extraordinarily prolonged period of time. And irrespective of what you think of the Israeli state and the morality of their actions, I think we can probably say they're at least competent enough to not do that. Secondly on that, I think it probably actually is a serious logistical problem, and it's not just the case it's a political impediment we can wave away. Moving 250,000 people who are not going to leave is really difficult. You typically need to send in armies to do this, and when the people you're trying to move often have weapons, 
That's something that's not really politically viable in any circumstance. And given this probably does need the backing of some form of international community, I think a situation where there is going to be so significant violence with this probably means that it's not going to be implemented. And I think we probably need to accept that this is unfortunate, no thank you, but it's something that is true. I'll talk about two main things in the speech. I'm going to talk about political responsibility, because I think this is the more interesting philosophical line we've gotten out of these guys. And I'm second, just going to talk about the state of politics at the moment and why it seems extraordinarily unlikely that the two-state solution could ever be implemented, at the very least, not in the lifetime of anyone here. So political responsibility. We've heard a number of things on this. We've been told it's nice to be optimistic. We've been told discourse around certain solutions might be beneficial. <coughs> if it is the case that we have to actually make a choice around the discourse we want, and I'm not entirely sure we do. I don't really think the ramifications of the vote in this chamber actually matter that much, but let's pretend they do. Um, I think Gideon's view is actually significantly more plausible. I think it's much more, more beneficial if our discourse is going to be around accepting what the political reality is, working within that, and trying to do everything we can to improve the lives of people who are currently living in states of depri deprivation. If we think we should care about people who are suffering at the moment, what we probably should do is figure out what can we do to change their circumstance. And trying to talk about an idealistic solution that is going to require at a bare minimum 50, 60, 70 years to ever be implemented, that's probably not helping them in the short term. I think the discourse about fixing things is probably much better because we have been told what they probably do care about in Palestine at the moment. The ability to get jobs, the ability to move towards having some semblance of equal rights, the ability to access the most basic forms of social services that everyone in this room takes for granted. I think if we focus discourse around changing those things and finding ways of improving people's lives right here and right now, that's probably something that does result in people being better off. And look, obviously, it's not going to be enough in and of itself. Nothing is ever going to be enough. But it is something. And if you're able to improve people's quality of life, that probably is the single most impactful thing that anyone can do. Because ultimately, we have one life, well, one life each. We live it, it's short. We probably want to improve that as much as possible. And hoping that in the future we might change things dramatically is something that's nice, but it's not something that's realistically plausible. Perhaps it is possible, as Sharon outlines, that this could somehow in the future resurrect the two-state solution. But I think, again, if we need to rely on literally everything that currently exists changing, that probably does mean it is dead at the moment. And for this debate to have any reasonable dis meaning in terms of just addressing a factual question, that's probably what we need to answer. Is it likely in our lifetime? Is it possible based on the way politics is currently constructed? And that's, yeah, go ahead. My argument, I'm saying that literally everything is, uh, got, has got to change in order for a two-state solution to be implemented. I'm not saying it's from your argument. I'm saying it's from the political reality that most of us are probably aware of. But I'll go into that now. What is the political reality in Israel-Palestine? What is the reality we have to deal with? And it's not even a question of blame for either party. It's just an acceptance of what facts are going to be like for the political situation of all the actors we need to get on side. If we look within Israel, we have a situation where the far right do not want a two-state solution. They are at the moment the most powerful electoral force because they hold the balance of power as to whether or not someone is in government or out of government. This is admittedly a short-term thing, but the thing is that it consists over the long term. And the reason it persists is that the rest of the people in Israel don't really care about the two-state solution being implemented in any meaningful way. It is lip service. No one in Israel is ever going to seriously argue and ever get through the political will to try and force this through, to force a two-state solution to actually be implemented. And why is this the case? The simple reason, first of all, is there's just no votes in it for any reasonable Israeli prime minister. Because outside of the far right, who will always oppose this, most people don't see this as electorally determinative to them. What people care about when it comes to elections is what is going to materially improve their lives in the short term, potentially over the medium term, if they're really thinking about it carefully. But they're not going to care about other people's lives very much, and it's unlikely they're ever going to change that circumstance. And unfortunately, that means that even if people might like the idea of a two-state solution, even if they might think that it's something that we want to move to at some point, it's never politically feasible. And it's something that you never want to say and make the majority of your platform because it means it's unlikely you'll ever be able to get into government. And by contrast, there is a genuine risk to you if you choose to do it. Given the historical example of Rabin, there is a mild risk of assassination if you try to push it too far. And so if that's the political reality you're dealing with, that's one that probably means you're never going to force this through. And this is also a problem that doesn't just stay static or maybe diminishes. It's one that's going to get worse every year that goes on. Because as the settlements expand, it becomes more politically difficult to ever consider getting rid of them because there's more votes that are tied up with them and simply it's going to be a much more difficult issue to deal with. So politically, it becomes more and more difficult to ever achieve a two-state solution. And similarly, when you look at the demographic change within Israel, votes are tending towards the far right. And we think that's something that probably is an issue. It does mean that over time, it becomes even more difficult to ever countenance a two-state solution being brought in. 
Even within Palestine, things are not really looking good for the two-state solution. Hamas and Fatah refuse to negotiate with each other, and it doesn't ever look like they really will. And the reason for that is not anything beyond the fact that one side would have to accept it needs to lose all power that it currently holds. And that's something I don't think either of them would ever be willing to accept. And unless you have both of them willing to stay in a room, negotiate over it, you can't get any of the first steps needed towards having a viable two-state solution. Because if the only way you could implement it is effectively an invasion, that's something that's unlikely to fly in the international community, and that's something that's unlikely for Israel to do. So without the agreement there, you're never going to have a situation where it's feasible to push for a two-state solution. And given it's unlikely you ever get that in the first place, you're not likely to see change. But even if they did negotiate, it's unclear they'd be able to push it through. It's unclear that their international backers would allow them to do so. And it's similarly within the Israeli situation. It's unclear that anyone who seriously looked like they might do it would be able to live and tell the tale. Because we know from Sadat's assassination when he treated with Israel that it is a genuine problem to be able to push things too far for certain interest groups. And that is something that does mean you fear doing it. And if you fear doing it to that degree, I don't think many people ever will. And then in the international community, because we do accept this is a realm that probably does need to be talked about, there is no political will to ever do anything tangible. We've been told that it might be the case they want to support the things they already officially say they support. I don't know why they would ever want to risk their own soldiers' lives if they had to do an intervention, or why they would ever risk actually having been responsible for people dying or expending any money themselves on other people. I don't see why anyone would ever want to do that. I think it is the case that Israel, at least in numeric terms, is the most condemned nation in the United Nations. I think that's the extent of the political will that currently exists in the international community. I think the margin that Israel wins that record is probably going to increase all the time, but I don't think you're going to get any change beyond that. I think it's going to be a situation where that just keeps increasing, but ultimately no one does anything. Paper resolutions are paper resolutions. They don't impact people's lives in any material way. And this is something that is horrific. This is something I think none of us enjoy, but it is also just true. And we know that it's really unfortunate, but people unfortunately don't care about trying to do the right thing, or more accurately, they don't care enough to do the things that will be necessary. And as horrific as that is to say, it means the two-state solution probably is dead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair. We now go to our third speaker on the opposition. Raphael Cohen Almagor, a political theorist and professor. He's the incumbent chair in politics at the University of Hull. He's published extensively on political science, law, ethics, and philosophy. Raphael, the floor is yours. Thank you. I am delighted to be in beautiful Cambridge, and I have to say that I sat on that side of the aisle in Oxford in a debate with Gideon on two-state solution, siding with two-state solution. And I want to say to Gideon today, Gideon, it is not a matter of being an audience in Cambridge or in the other place. It's not a matter of left or right. It's a matter of deciding about justice. And I'm sure that this audience is as reasonable as the audience in Oxford, in the other place, to decide on the side of justice. Because two-state solution is the most just solution. Any other solution is going to be more costly, more bloody, and less just. This is the thesis of my talk. I want to start with a story. Martha enjoys frequenting very distinguished establishments like McDonald's, Burger King, and KFC. She likes to go there, and one day, when she is having a delightful meal, she sees that there is a man choking over a chicken bone. Martha rushes to that man. She performs the Heimlich maneuver and saves a human life. Angel Michael is sitting upstairs in heaven, watching the creation, watching the universe, and he saw what happened. He saw that Martha saved human life. And he says, I'm going to reward Martha. He comes and presents himself to Martha. She's delighted to meet Michael. And Michael tells her, 
because you saved a human life, I want to grant you one wish. Anything that you want, I am going to give it to you. But on one premise, I'm going to ask you five questions, and you have to, ask, to answer this question truthfully. You can't deceive me, you cannot lie. If you answer these questions, and all of them are instrumental to whatever you want to do, then I will grant your wish. Mother says, fine. What is your wish? Ask Mike. And Martha says, I would very much like to be Miss Universe. Michael says, okay, that can be done. My first question, are you willing to commit 100% of your time for this purpose? Martha says, yes. Are you willing to commit 50% of your income on clothes and beauty products? Martha says, easy, I already do this. Are you willing to get classes from former Miss Universe training? I'd be delighted. Are you willing to sacrifice your privacy? Because once you'll be in the glare, in the limelight, your privacy is going to be gone. Uh, that's more difficult. She thinks for a while and she says, yes. Good. Are you willing to abide by a strict diet? Marta is looking at the KFC bucket. And then reluctantly she says, no. Michael disappears. What is the moral of this story? Why I'm telling you this? I'm telling you this because people and nations should have a clear end game and devise a clear plan so as to know how to achieve their goals. If you are not willing to commit, your goal would remain only a dream. If you close an option, and my dear audience, if you declare today the two-state solution is dead, then this audience, according to your mind, you are closing a solution. This goal might never be achieved. Michael won't return to generously offer his help again. Those who hold this motion need to substantiate it by arguing that other solution or solutions are alive before you bury this solution. Two-state solution is as alive as any other solution. Two-state solution was, is, and remains the most just solution and the least bloody solution. You are right that tonight, today, two-state solution is dead. It is dead because powerful people on both sides wish it to be dead. If there will be powerful people on both sides who may wish to see it alive, then two-state solution will be very much alive. People may try other solutions, but I think that in the end, two-state solution will be the result in one form or another. Why do I think so? And there are several reasons I can give you why I think the two-state solution is going to happen. You may call me eternal optimistic, you may call me delusional, you may call me hopeful, but I have reasons, I'll explain it. The first reason is history. We are talking about two people who have just claims over the same small piece of land. There are no angels in that story. You can't put all responsibility, all blame on one side. And therefore, the land should be divided. There is something that we call in politics the democratic pendulum. The Likud is not going to stay in power forever. Because people understand, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what happens in Israel, if you follow the news in Israel in the past two weeks, is another testimony to that, to corruption. So there will be a democratic pendulum. And there will be a labor movement in government again. 
people who love, appreciate, and willing to pay the price for peace. And on the Palestinian side, I don't believe that Abu Mazen is going to preside and corrupt forever. He will go as well. You spoke about settlements. You don't have to evacuate 250,000 people. And I'm not going to underestimate the cost involved. But according to the solution, the two-state solution, the five settlement blocks are going to remain, comprising of 80% of the settlers. We are talking about less than 4% of the West Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, it is still doable. Israel can compensate for the 4% with other land, with equal size, with equal value of land. Another reason is the force of moderation. Moderation is forceful. People do not wish to go to the extreme. The value of hope, the value of reason. People understand what is right and what is wrong. People understand that the occupation is unjust. People understand that bullying is unjust. People understand that terrorism is evil. People understand the only thing that violence breeds is more violence. And you cannot extinguish fire with fire. That's the power of reason. That's the power of moderation. And therefore, we need to create a safe and better place for our children. And the only way that we can do this is via two-state solution. There's no other way. Now, I said, if you want to bury one solution, you have to propose another. What are the alternatives? So Gideon mentioned one-state solution. How many people support one-state solution? Gideon Levy. Did I mention Gideon Levy? Who wants two-state solution? But some even mentioned three-state solution. Ask the Palestinian. How many Palestinians support three-state solution? Nobody supports three-state solution. The Palestinian will have to find a way to resolve their own differences with Hamas. But of course, three-state solution is not a solution. Confederation, yes, it's the optimal, ultimate solution. Again, the question is about will. Who wants it? Jordan wants it? No. Egypt wants it? No. Israel wants it? No. Palestine wants it? No. So what do you want? Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Egypt together? That's after the Messiah will come. You have to be realistic. What do you want? To suffocate the Palestinians? No. You want to drive all the Jews to the sea? No. I have to say that Bassam Eid himself recognized that there'll be two state solution is a just yes solution. He should have been sit here. So actually it's five against three. It's a bit unfair here. Two state solution is still the most popular solution both in Israel and in Palestine. According to the last poll, 47% of Palestinians, 46% of Israeli Jews will favor the principle of, of a two state solution. It's still the preferred solution. I know that the human tendency to think is that whatever exists is going to remain. But you know it's wrong. Because all, all the unjust regimes that happened in history, they're all gone from Earth. During the time of slavery, people believed that slavery is going to stay forever. They were wrong. During feudal time, people believed that feudalism is going to stay forever. They were wrong. The Berlin Wall, apartheid in South Africa, Northern Ireland. We've seen that things that are wrong, they are gone from the world. Why did we, they went from the world? Because the system were unjust. We have a tendency to secure justice, and with time, justice will prevail. And therefore, I'm saying, two-state solution is the most just solution. Therefore, it was, is, and will remain on this table. Thank you very much. We'll now have one final quick round of floor speeches. Would anyone like to speak in proposition? Yes. So 
we, we are not here to debate what is a just solution, what is a, uh, the right solution. We are here to debate if it is dead or not. Uh, some of us, and I cannot presume to speak on behalf of everyone, but some of us really do want a two-state solution. We want Palestine to exist. We can accept that Israel can exist. But here I am, a Lebanese, being shocked at agreeing with an Israeli. Uh, usually they bomb us, so we never agree on anything. But uh, the reality is that the state of Israel does not want a two-state solution, so I find myself in agreement. And uh, Israel is a state that has never defined its borders. And the reason is that with every new settlement, its borders are expanding. So the reality is, if we really want justice, what we need to do is to look at the political situation wide-eyed and with the expediency to understand what it is. And if we really want to find solution, we need to see it for what it is. And there is a difference between what is and what should be. And if we want to end up where it should be, then we need to understand the facts as they are today. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak in opposition? Yes, just here. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to remember that the state is not just a bureaucratic entity that deals with economic and policy issues, but rather it's an expression of our identity. Um, the Palestinians and the Israelis have shown over the past decades and indeed the last centuries that each of them have a very distinct past and future and trying to amalgamate them artificially into one state will result in the same situation as we find currently in Iraq and Syria where groups of um, communities have been put together artificially with no common future and have broken apart under that strain. I think it's important to remember and learn from and learn from the, the experiences of those around us. The, op the proposition have often referred to reality and facts on the ground. Why not look at all the analogues that surround us? Now, let's look at the Palestinian situation nowadays. It's been emphatically stated that the Palestinians are not ready for a state um, or they are not prepared to make a state. However, I think it is undeniable that the Palestinian leadership has systematically um, underperformed and has systematically betrayed its people. It's widely known that Hamas, amongst other groups, kill, more, kill by a multiple of more than 10 times more of their own people than Israelis do in retaliatory airstrikes. It is unfortunate that Hamas operates a government which routinely executes um, a recent EU report which I will email to you following the event. Thank you. Uh, none, I just answered your question. Thank you. I think it's, no, that wasn't that was the, end. the end. I was okay. thanking Norman. Sorry. Um, so, the, Palestinian, the Palestinians, I hope, will eventually wake up to the reality of the future they could have if they did not have a government that executed homosexuals, executed political opponents, and consistently reinvested the aid that they were supplied with into terrorist infrastructure. I believe that the Palestinians will work, as they have done in Rawabi, and as individuals such as Bassem over here have done from a grassroots um, level up to build their own state and to build a future for themselves. And for this reason, I, ha I very much believe in a positive and bright future for two states side by side. And I think the force of history and the force of the great futures which await both nations will speak for itself. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, anyone in abstention of the motion? At the back, yes. Thank you. I'd just like to clear up um, two misconceptions without agreeing or disagreeing with uh, the resolution. First thing, uh, Gidon Levy, I love you, you're really cool, and I love what you're doing for Israel. But I think that it's not accurate to say that not a single Israeli leader has ever uh, been willing to create a two-state solution. I think that you say that I think Barack was willing to go for a two-state solution, maybe not exactly in the 67 lines, but I think he was willing to do it. Olmert was actually quite close. He negotiated secretly with Abbas in 2007, and I do genuinely think he was willing to go for a two-state solution, and even Abbas implied so in a Channel 10 uh, documentary that was done on these talks. That's the first thing. Second misconception, and you know, that's for Norman Filkenstein. You're cool too, 
but I think there's a certain, there's a certain um, mis misconception that you and I think several people, additional people in, um, that I have spoken today have peddled and it's that, uh, and it's a false binary. It's the binary that um, we, have one of two we have two options, either the continuation of a status quo with an eventual, with a possible uh, deterioration, degeneration into a one state apartheid-like reality, Very not, we don't like that, or two state solution, which is, yeah, you know, we all, we all want that. I'm afraid to say that I think that our choices, we have to be more pessimistic about our choices because I think there's a third possibility that no one has considered so far, which is some kind of, you know, and I really hope it doesn't happen, but I think it's some kind of genocide or ethnic cleansing that will also be a kind of solution for the long term, but none of us want to get there, which is why I personally support a two-state solution, but, you know, I think that we need to be clear about what reality in the future could hold for us. Thank you. Thank you. And now finally, to close the proposition side, we welcome George Clay. George graduated from Jesus in 2017 and is now completing an MPhil in, English, in early modern history at Hughes Hall. George, the floor is yours. Thank you. If you were to accept the arguments of the opposition in this debate, you'd be, left with, uh, you'd be left with a simple question. Is any state actually dead? Is any solution to any political problem actually dead? Because if we were to believe this side of the house, then apparently just the idea that a solution can exist, if you believe their first speaker, is enough to say the solution's not dead. If you believe their second speaker, then just the idea that a government might be willing to deport 250,000 of its own citizens one unspecified day in the future. Apparently, that's enough to say that a solution is not dead. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to challenge the opposition in this debate to name a single proposed solution to any political problem which they actually think is dead. Because as far as I can tell, they're not trying to argue with us by engaging with the points that our side has brought. They're just trying to argue with us by redefining the word dead so as to say that no matter what we talk about on our side of the house, the Israeli-Palestinian two-state solution is still alive. In my speech, I'm going to go exhaustively into this idea that, uh, you know, we need to agree on what the word dead actually means. And maybe once we have agreed on what the word dead actually means, then maybe we can start having a real debate. It pains me, but often debates are about the meaning of words, and I think until they can work out a consistent definition of what they're standing for, they simply can't win this debate. Let's go into detail as to the arguments we've heard from that side of the house. The first idea we heard from that side of the house is that it's impossible to call a state dead because a state is an imagined community. So if we're to believe this argument, if we're to believe the first opposition speaker, all of us in this room would have to believe that the Confederate States of America is not dead. Let me explain that. First opposition said that the idea of a state cannot, uh, can, by definition, not be dead because it's an imagined community. But in that case, the Confederacy is still alive and well because there are millions of people who regrettably uh, still choose proudly to display its symbols, who still choose to fly its flag, and who still choose to define themselves as part of a white nationalist nation in the southern United States. Uh, and in fact, if we're accepting the idea that for a state to be alive, all it takes is for some people to be able to imagine themselves to be part of a state, then actually what they're really saying is that there already is a Palestinian state. Because there is a community of millions of people all around the world 
who define themselves as Palestinian, who define themselves as part of a Palestinian nation. If we're to believe that all it takes to make a state is for people to imagine themselves as part of a community, then opposition would have you believe that there already is a Palestinian state. But I don't think that's what they believe, and it certainly wouldn't sit very well with their second speaker's rhetoric, that the situation in Palestine is so dire that children are literally being poisoned. So, as a result of that, we should probably believe that it's not enough simply to imagine that a state can exist. That has to be backed up by some kind of empirical reality, like uh, a governmental structure, a system of bureaucracy, reasonably defined borders, and some idea of the rule of law, which can actually bring a reality into the lives of people, rather than just an idea in the minds of academics. So, I need, to ask, I need the opposition to answer a question in this debate of do they believe the Confederate States of America are still alive, and do they believe that there is a Palestinian state at the moment? Because if they don't believe those two things, then simply saying the idea of a two-state solution exists is not good enough to win this debate. No thanks, May maybe later. Um, but it's actually worse than that. Because if they don't want to defend the idea of an imagined community, if they don't want to defend the idea that a state's alive just because some people think it's alive, then they have to fall back on the arguments of their second speaker. That yes, the state is alive, the Palestinian state in the future may be alive, uh, but only if Likud, or an unspecified future government of Israel, makes the decision to dismantle the settlements. And I think there was some wordplay going on here when Norman said it only requires 2% of land in, in Palestine to be dismantled and only 250,000 people to be moved. The extent to which this is wildly unlikely to happen simply can't be overstated. And Alice has already gone into detail as to why that is. But I just want to make an observation that um, as a historian who, who specializes in the mass movement of people and actually transatlantic diasporas and transatlantic slave trades, um, my thesis is about 12 million people being forcibly moved all across the world, all across the Atlantic world. And I literally can't think of a single example in history where 250,000 people have been uprooted and moved completely voluntarily, completely without some kind of political cost being associated with it. I certainly can't think of a single example of when a government has willingly inflicted the movement of 250,000 people on its own citizens. The closest, uh, I'll come back to you in a moment, but just for the record, the closest example I can think is the forcible movement of British citizens to Australia throughout the 19th to the mid 20th century. Um, and I think it's telling that that's still to this day understood to be a stain on the conscience of both countries. Because the idea that you'd inflict that forcible movement on 250,000 of your own citizens is just so far beyond the pale that I don't think it's credible that any government no matter whether it's Likud or no matter whether it's some future unspecified government of Israel, I just don't think it's credible that people are going to sign up to that solution willingly. So, sorry, you had a point. The moment's passed, great. Um, so, uh, what would be your comment on the evacuation of a million French settlers from Algeria by the French government at the end of that um, um, conflict? <laughs> Uh, that the French military was so unhappy with that that they attempted to assassinate Charles de Gaulle. I mean, I don't think that's an example that works very well there, for you. Sorry? The political, the political will, will was that. Okay, you got me there. I don't know that much about that example. But I will say... <laughs> you know, it's, 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 a relative, it's a relatively fair cop. But I will say that the extent to which that was wildly controversial did lead generals in the French military to attempt to assassinate President de Gaulle, did lead to a hopeless political polarization of France that lasted for decades, and did lead to riots on the streets of Paris in 1968 and the fall of the Fourth Republic and its replacement by the Fifth Republic. Point like, of information? The idea that... No, thanks. The idea... <laughs> The idea that that level of political will will willingly be replicated in the future just does not seem particularly credible. So, the next thing that opposition told us was that a two-state solution can come about insofar as the international community is willing to step in. And the logic we had for this is that the international community will prefer to impose a two-state solution than see the destruction of the Jewish homeland. Um, my first comment on that is how exactly can the international community impose a two-state uh, two solution 
on the Israeli government, considering that Israel has, is a state which has shown itself very, very willing to defend its territorial integrity in the past, and considering that I certainly can't think of a single Western leader who'd willingly engage with open conflict with Israel. But more importantly, the underlying logic of this point is deeply flawed, because the logic went, they will the international community will prefer a two-state solution to the destruction of a Jewish homeland. That neglects the fact that in the minds of many Israelis, and therefore in the minds of many members of the international community, a two-state solution is the destruction of the Jewish homeland and does constitute an existential threat to Israel. I think it is a fairly common belief among, certainly among settlers, also among certain prominent members of the Likud party, that if Israeli troops were to, ref were to withdraw from the occupied territories, then that would rapidly create a vacuum of authority which would be exploited by terrorist groups to attack the heartland of Israel. And they only have to go back 14 years to the evacuation of Gaza to see a concrete example of this actually happening. I am not saying for a moment that the withdrawal of Israeli troops would certainly cause that vacuum. But I'm saying that many people believe that, and insofar as they do believe that, they see the creation of a two-state solution as a mortal threat to Israel. So insofar, as Professor Finkelstein was asking people to choose between two options, he neglects the fact that in the minds of many influential decision makers, those two options are exactly the same. The final thing, no thanks, I've taken one. The final thing that we heard from that side of the house is that when Israel's backs are to the wall, they will finally be pushed to make concessions. My question to that is simple. How will you ever get to a situation where Israel's backs are pushed to the wall? It's happened perhaps once in Israel's history, briefly in 1973, and that, was that situation was turned around in 48 hours thanks to emergency aid from the United States military. So I just don't see a situation where a government of Israel seriously thinks its backs are to the wall, especially not in a, situa especially not in a situation where existing military alliances are maintained, and Israel still has an overwhelming superiority in every single military technology I can think of. I just don't think the leverage on the government of Israel is there, and for as long as that is true, it's simply not plausible that they'll make concessions. I need to start wrapping up my speech, but at the end of this debate, there are just a number of questions that I think opposition need to answer in their final speech before they have a chance of winning this debate. <coughs> Firstly, they need to give us an example of a state which is actually dead, uh, and a solution to a political problem which is actually dead, because so far, all they've told us is moonshot solutions which are wildly, wildly unlikely to happen, but which they nonetheless think are still alive. The second question that they need to answer is can they honestly give us a scenario in which an Israeli prime minister, secure in the knowledge of United States military support, secure in the knowledge that votes from white wing settlers are the basis of their power, and secure in their political position because of that, and comfortable in their political position because of that, can they honestly give me a scenario in which that person willingly chooses to inflict effective deportation on 250,000 of their own citizens? Until they can show me how that political will is conjured, without falling back on the example of, uh, of Algeria, which created French military attempts to assassinate Charles de Gaulle, unless they can show me that plausible scenario, then Hail Marys will simply never be enough, and they simply can't win this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. And finally, Daniel Orenstein to oppose this debate. <laughs> Daniel is the president of the Israel Society at Cambridge and has a fan club. <clears throat> Mr. President, guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be with you here this evening. Um, I'm Daniel Orenstein, I'm the president of the Cambridge University Israel Society, um, and it's a pleasure to be here to discuss the two-state solution, which, unlike the proposition speakers have said, is not a Hail Mary in the slightest. The 40 minutes of proposition speeches you've just heard can be summed up in one word, pessimism. But proving the two-state solution is dead requires far more than just pessimism. The key to my counter-argument 
lies in the fact that it's a fallacy to use the bleakness of the current status quo to deny the inherent feasibility of the two-state solution. And let's not forget, it's the only solution that offers self-determination to two peoples in the land that they both have legitimate claims. To tackle this motion, my colleagues for the opposition and I need only show that the two-state solution is a possibility sometime in the future, as the proposition have said over and over again. But far more than just opposing the motion, I hope to convince you that the two-state solution is, in fact, far closer to implementation than most external observers imagine. But before I do, allow me to pick up on two um, issues that the proposition have misrepresented as preventing peace, Jerusalem and the settlements. The situation in Jerusalem is as follows. Israel has had sovereignty over the western part of Jerusalem since the armistice agreement with Jordan in 1949. And ever since, it's been the seat of its government and judiciary and the city where every foreign leader is hosted. Anyone who believes a solution will ever be agreed upon in which Israel doesn't have Jerusalem as its capital fundamentally misunderstands this conflict. But now I'm sure you're thinking, what about the Palestinian claim to Jerusalem? The truth is that Jerusalem is not the Gordian knot it's so often presented to be. As it stands, most Israelis live in the west of the city, while most Palestinians live in the east, with division along current residential lines a patent possibility. While the issue of Haram al-Sharif, or the Temple Mount, adds some complication, Israel has offered custody of Al-Aqsa Mosque to the Palestinians in the past, most famously at the Camp David summit in 2000. So to summarize that point, a negotiated solution with Jerusalem partitioned as the capital of two countries is both geographically and demographically plausible, justified, and viable. Not my hand, makes progress. The next issue I want to deal with briefly is settlements. Ill-informed activists and politicians alike regularly cite settlements as the number one reason for the ongoing conflict, but it begs two questions. Firstly, why wasn't a negotiated agreement made between 1949 and 1967 when Jordan occupied that entire territory and no settlements existed? And secondly, surely if settlements are the number one factor, Gaza should be Israel's most peaceful border. Thinking about Alistair and, um, and Charlie, Charlie? George, George's point, sorry. I wrote everything down that you said other than your name. Um, let's think about Alistair and George's points. Israel has proven time and again it's prepared to undertake traumatic action against its own citizens in return for peace, having forcibly relocated thousands from the Sinai to make peace with Egypt and almost 10,000 from Gaza by force in 2005 to create the first ever independent Palestinian territory. And by the way, that was a right-wing government that did so. The paradigm that settlements are the key obstacle to peace could not be more misconstrued. Gideon Levy likes to claim that settlements are on some kind of exponential rise, but according to his own newspaper, the reality on the ground is staggeringly different. In their study from 2015, they found that the rate of settlement growth under Netanyahu is the slowest it's been in almost 25 years, and even total settlement freezes, like 10 months in 2010, that Alistair failed to mention entirely, have failed to bring the Palestinian leadership back to the negotiating table. In summary, the, propor the proposition have failed to realize that employing the myth that settlements are an impassable obstacle to peace simply undermines their argument. But having addressed those two issues, I'd now like to talk about the factor that I consider to be primarily responsible for precluding peace. The failure to date of the Palestinians to come to terms with the existence of a Jewish state. But crucially, at the end of my speech, I'll return to why the next generation of Palestinians hold the key to advancing the peace process. The early Palestinian leadership were led down the cul-de-sac of rejectionism by the Arab dictators of the 20th century. But rejectionism manifests itself nowadays in two major aspects of the conflict, stagnation of peace negotiations and the issue of refugees. Only in the context of rejectionism is it possible to understand why the Palestinian leadership have failed repeatedly to accept reasonable peace deals with the Israelis. And one deal that I would describe as reasonable that's been mentioned by no one on, on the panel tonight is 97% of the West Bank that was offered by Ehud Barak at the Camp David summit in 2000. Now, according to US chief negotiator Dennis Ross, Yasser Arafat rejected the proposals entirely and failed to come up with any solution of his own. And by the way, just a quick point on Yasser Arafat. You should know that back in 1993, at the signing of the Oslo Accords, Yasser Arafat was so afraid of even being seen to cooperate with Israel, he forced a different PLO official to sign the documents. So I need to make progress. Any strategic negotiator will tell you that to achieve your aims, you must initially over-demand. But is it not patently obvious that you cannot negotiate with a party that refuses outright to make concessions? In fact, exactly one year ago, Israel's defense secretary offered to build an airport, a seaport, and industrial zones that would create 40,000 jobs in Gaza. 
if Hamas agreed to dismantling its rocket systems and tunnel network. The response from Hamas spokesman Mahmoud al-Zahar was abject refusal. Now we come to the vital issue of refugees, one of the final status issues. There should be no doubt that Palestinian refugees have faced hardship and suffering over the last 70 years. But what if I told you that hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees have been abusing global charity initiatives by retaining their refugee status despite having regained social and economic security? In fact, the case of Palestinian refugees is the only instance in the history of international conflict that the descendants of refugees have maintained their status as a purposeful political whip. One year ago, I went to a Maori refugee camp in Ramallah to see a brand new state-of-the-art IT teaching suite that had been donated to improve the standard of education. During the visit, I got into a discussion with one of the senior officials there, and I was truly shocked when he told me that 95% of Amari's residents can afford to leave the refugee camp, but choose to remain to pressurize Israel. But having established that rejectionism bears far more responsibility than either Jerusalem or the settlements, I'd like to explain why even rejectionism cannot kill the two-state solution. The reason is, is that the era of rejectionism is ending. And that's a point that no one on the panel has failed to recognize, other than Sharon, who works with Palestinian and Israeli kids on a day-to-day -day basis. On that same trip to Ramallah, I visited the headquarters of the Fatah Youth Wing. And what they said to me is one of the strongest reasons I stand so firmly in opposition to this motion. They said unequivocally that they want a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Despite receiving an education that features suicide bomb death counts as the context for maths problems, Palestinian youth recognize that their parents' undying wish to turn back the clock to 1947 is only prolonging their suffering. And on the other hand, young Israelis realize that tighter controls on the lives of Palestinians are a status quo that cannot be maintained despite their effectiveness in preventing terrorism. And a classic example is the West Bank separation barrier forcing innocent Palestinians on a day-to-day -day basis to queue to pass through checkpoints, but has reduced the death count from terrorism by almost 300 per year. What is clear, though, is that Israeli and Palestinian youth together recognize that a century of conflict has brought so much unnecessary death and destruction, and they recognize a negotiated two-state solution offers an end to the suffering on both sides. And this is why declaring it dead, whether or not you want to spend hours defining what dead is, is such a backward-looking and illogical conclusion to make. I started my speech by demonstrating how Jerusalem and the settlements are not the alleged death sentences for the two-state solution they're so often made out to be. It doesn't matter if you believe in one state, two states, three states, or four states. The bleakness of the present day cannot be used to challenge the fundamental feasibility of the two-state solution or any other solution. That's simply endorsing the excuses of the rejectionists. And if the international community really wants to bring peace to the region, they need to stop appeasing Mahmoud Abbas's ploys and start investing in the next generation of leaders. If you need any more convincing that the two-state solution is alive and well, public opinion polls hold the answers. Year after year, as our speakers have alluded to, support for the two-state solution remains high, especially amongst young people, despite the lack of progress. Far from being dead, the two-state solution is closer than one might expect. The Palestinians already have a skeleton state. Maybe if Alistair would have done his research, he might have realized that they actually have far more national institutions than he's, he's, he's alluded to. They have a government, a judicial system, a police force, non-member observer status at the UN, uh, a modern civil infrastructure, a strong economy, um, a 96% literacy rate. Optimistic estimates suggest that once a peace deal has been agreed, implementation would only take 12 months. But it will remain 12 months away until the existing reconciliatory attitudes amongst Palestinian youth of today begin to pervade into mainstream Palestinian political discourse. My colleagues for the opposition and I have clearly approached this issue from vastly different angles. But the thread that binds our argument is that despite the hiatus in the peace process, it's simply fatuous to rubber stamp the two-state solution as dead. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to organize the event with Jonah. And I strongly call on you to vote against this motion. Thank you very much um, for your speech. I'd also like to thank the Cambridge Palestinian Society, who I also work closely with to make this debate happen. Sadly, Ed couldn't debate tonight, um, but hopefully he's watching online. So we vote here with our feet.
If you'd like to vote for the proposition, walk through the door on the right marked eyes. And for the opposition, no's. And if you would like to abstain, through the middle. Results will be out in 10 minutes. Thank you.